Some say that the generative AI boom is just getting started, while others say that it'll fade away relatively soon. Can you share your views on this? I think it depends on what you mean by the AI boom. If you're referring to the kind of typical artificial intelligence hype cycle, which we've had several, I think we're in the thick of it right now. And I think that is going to wear off. A lot of the companies that have very high valuations and are raising money at very high valuations, you know, a lot of them aren't going to make it and the whole thing will calm down a little bit. But that's a different question from the effects of generative AI and how it will roll out through the economy. And I think we're absolutely just at the beginning of seeing the societal and economic effects of generative artificial intelligence. Generative AI is already impacting many areas of our lives, including language translation, quote generation, image and video generation, writing and content creation, just to name a few. But what are your predictions for major trends of generative AI in 2024? And how do you see that affecting our lives even further? There's the short term, which is 2024. And we're going to see basically more of the same, more systems. Uh, we're going to see improvements to those systems. We'll probably see some new capabilities, integration with other applications and things like that. That's the very short term. In terms of a slightly longer time frame, maybe uh, you know three to five years, we're going to see some really interesting new innovations. Um, in particular, right now, the way these systems are designed, they're basically just shoveling in all the words and stuff they can and pictures and whatever off the internet. And uh, this is what they get. Well, you don't need, if you're building a system, for example, to uh, service uh, medical professionals, it doesn't need to know all of the works of Shakespeare. So we're going to get much more uh, curated collections of data to be fed into these systems. And that means the systems will be more efficient. They'll be smaller. They'll uh, be much more accurate in what they have to say, since there isn't all the nonsense and garbage that you find on the internet jogged into them in their uh, training process. But the real departure is going to occur when instead of training them just on words, on verbiage, or on pictures, on stuff that was easy to lay our hands on because it's all over the internet, we start to hook them up to uh, different kinds of sensors, uh, particularly cameras, microphones, God knows what else. And these systems then can apply their same learning capabilities to all of that data. And there's no telling what they're going to come up with because they will be able to find patterns and reach conclusions that are unknown to us and that uh, will probably be uh, very profound and have a significant effect on the utility of these systems. Uh, you'll be consulting them to find out the answers to all of your questions simply because they will know more and uh, have more experience in some sense with the real world uh, than a single individual can have. ChatGPT has been evolving since it first came out and its subscription-based ChatGPT Plus and GPT-4 have been released. And now users can take advantage of hundreds of plugins. So what are your thoughts on whether the ChatGPT ecosystem will transform our lives the way that Android and iOS did? Well, there, let me take your uh, question and tease it apart into two parts. Um, there's the question of whether we're going to see the same kinds of ecosystems that we see with applications uh, for uh, you know the Android or the iPhone and other similar uh, systems uh, before that. And the answer to that is absolutely yes. Uh, there's going to be all kinds of specialized versions of these systems and plugins that help help to connect them to different applications or whatever it might be. And uh, that's going to be absolutely terrific. And there's going to be a huge market for that and lots and lots of business opportunities both for individuals uh, and for businesses. The question you asked was very specific about ChatGPT. It is not at all clear that that system in particular is going to win that particular race. There's usually one or two uh, systems that succeed in doing so. I think they've got a pretty good shot at it because of their relationship and backing from Microsoft. But I've learned in the past that uh, programs or companies that seemed absolutely dominant and that would never, uh, you'd never believe could possibly be supplanted, do get supplanted. Just look at social media. There was a long list of companies, uh, MySpace, uh, Friendster, uh, I can't even remember all of them, that were around before Facebook, and they were enormous. And uh, it was very hard to imagine that they would be supplanted. Uh, there are lots and lots of examples of this uh, in the computer industry. And so I can't specifically say that ChatGPT, which is from OpenAI, will 
uh, be a major player in that space. But as a first mover and with the relationship they have with Microsoft, I think there's a good chance that they will certainly be among the most dominant systems. What are some major changes that we can expect to see in healthcare as a result of the AI development? Healthcare is one of the areas that's going to see a major impact from a generative artificial intelligence. And the most obvious one is right now, if you want to get healthcare, you've got to go visit a, a licensed doctor. And uh, maybe you can do that uh, over the internet now for some people today. But most people just simply don't have access to the same kind of medical knowledge, uh, expertise, and professionals that uh, the you and I probably have, have access to, uh, particularly in uh, developing countries or third world countries. And for them, this is going to be an absolute godsend because you will be able to build systems and people will be able to consult these systems directly on their phones or their computers from anywhere in the world to get world-class diagnostic and Adv uh, advice and all kinds of other medical uh, ad uh, advances that will become available to them through the internet at extremely low cost and uh, without having to travel typically to go see a doctor and it'll just be widely available. Uh, that's going to change everything in those places. And I think it's going to be a great boon for uh, places where currently access to medical care is very difficult. In your forthcoming book, Generative Artificial Intelligence, what everyone needs to know. You argued that generative AI's medical knowledge will exceed that of human doctors and be more up to date. So can you elaborate on this point? Sure. I'm just saying that a single program will know more than any individual doctor or human because it's capable of uh, processing a great deal more information and can do a better job. But that's not to say it won't be better than all doctors taken together. That's a very different question. But I think even in the case of generative AI, we're likely to have medical specialists. You know, some of them will be for diagnosing uh, certain kinds of, uh, you know, medical images, for example. Others will be for cancer diagnosis. Uh, I, I can't really tell you the details of these different areas, but we'll have specialists and they'll all be tied together uh, so that probably you'll go to the equivalent of what in the US we call a GP, a general practitioner. That's uh, somebody who basically says, I don't know the answer to your question, but I've got a friend down the street that does know the answer to your question. Uh, the same way that one of these uh, medical GAIs is going to interview you at first, then say, I'm going to refer you off to a specialist GAI that will be capable of helping you with your particular problem. Your book, Humans Need Not Apply, was published in 2015, so that's seven years before ChatGPT was introduced. And it discusses how white-collar workers like lawyers are at risk of losing their jobs to automation and AI just as much as blue-collar workers. And when OpenAI announced GPT-4 last year, it said that the model outperformed 9 out of 10 human test takers in the bar exam. So how is AI impacting the legal system already? And what are some other changes we can expect to see in the future? I think that, as with many other professions, uh, GAI, a generative artificial intelligence, is going to have a substantial impact on the legal profession. The legal profession is primarily concerned with words and documents, and that's what these systems are particularly good for right now. Now, right now, they're not very accurate, and you may have seen some of the uh, rather humorous examples of people who didn't understand that these systems make things up. And so they uh, filed briefs in courts and got into big trouble for citing cases that didn't exist and things like that. But certainly uh, any decent lawyer, even today, uh, is probably going to uh, first turn to a generative AI system in order to get a first draft of whatever they are looking for. They'll describe what they want. And just like a good legal assistant, uh, the system will give them a draft. Now, they'll have to review that carefully and edit it uh, because it's got their name on it, and it needs to be uh, accurate and reflect the, the way in which they want to make their arguments, whatever it might be. But I mean, that's a tremendous advance over just having templates that you fill in for uh, certain kinds of uh, legal legal work. Um, I don't think we're going to see in the short term, in effect, robotic lawyers making arguments in court. That's not what we're talking about. But as a tool that helps uh, lawyers either research or find relevant case law or create uh, briefs of various kinds, I think, and, and form arguments, help them to structure and form arguments. This is going to be a boon for the legal profession. Now, is it putting lawyers out of jobs? Yes and no. Uh, really, the way to think about artificial intelligence is an advance in automation. 
And automation has a short-term effect of putting people out of jobs, but a long-term effect, a more important effect of uh, providing, changing the way in which people do their jobs. So lawyers will be doing their jobs differently in the future than they do today. And when they do that, they're more efficient, they're more effective. And I think we're going to see a, a, a decrease in the cost of legal work but a dramatic increase in the amount of legal work that can get done. So it's not necessarily the case that we'll have fewer lawyers in the future. In fact, another area is uh, they're going to have to, uh, uh, lawyers are going to have to figure out things like, can you out, uh, is the output of a generative AI system copyrightable? There are a lot of legal questions that are going to have to get settled. And they're basically, it's going to be a full employment act for lawyers for the foreseeable future. One major concern related to AI that we keep hearing about is how it could take over our jobs that will be replaced by these technologies. How real would you say this threat is? It depends on what your profession is, of course. On the other hand, I think that mostly what it's going to do is change the nature of work. In contrast to some previous waves of artificial intelligence, I think this wave is really something that works in a complementary fashion fashion with uh, people, with workers, and makes them more productive and brings them better tools for getting their jobs done and does that for a very broad set of uh, different professions. So just as the word processor has obviously affected many, many different professions, uh, it the generative artificial intelligence is probably going to do the same thing. Everybody will be using it. Everybody will be more productive. Uh, but in, again, I don't think it just pushes people out of work. What it's going to do is change the nature of the work that they do. Then what are some jobs that are likely to disappear due to AI? And how about the ones that will be unaffected or be even more in demand? Just to give you one, one area where these systems are really, really remarkably good is at doing computer programming. And basically, the job of a computer program is to take a specification for a program, usually somebody either telling the program or writing out, here's what I want the program to do. And they translate that into a set of instructions, that's the program, that, so that a machine is capable of uh, executing that particular uh, task, fulfilling that kind of a task. Now, um, these systems basically can do much of what a programmer does. You can consult it, tell it what you want, it'll spit out a program. So I do think that programming as we have known it, and certainly in my lifetime, I was a programmer for a very long time, that's dead. Uh, we're not gonna be doing that anymore. Instead, what we're going to be doing is wrestling with these systems to try to get them to output exactly what it is that we want or that we need. So that's an example of a profession which may contract and certainly is going to be changed uh, dramatically. Well, the ones will be unaffected are those professions where you want to have some kind of uh, emotional or interpersonal connection between people. That's not something you can do with a machine. You know, nobody wants to tell their troubles to an electronic bartender. So, you know, you're going to have human bartenders they are not going to be going anywhere. Um, and there are lots and lots of professions. You know, you, you won't have these machines teaching you to play tennis. You want to go talk to the, the tennis, uh, tennis champ or the tennis coach or whatever it might be. So when it's a question of being able to be persuasive, to be empathetic, uh, to connect on a personal level with somebody else, when that's an important characteristic of your job, I don't think your job is really at risk by automation from uh, generative artificial intelligence. And you stated in an interview that companies that discover high value businesses by applying generative AI will have an upper hand in AI monetization. And can you elaborate on this point and what kinds of companies will stand to gain the most from AI development? But the way to approach this, in my view, if I were a manager in any industry, is don't rush into it. Don't assume it's going to do something good for you or it's going to make a difference in your business. But let your employees try out this new technology and see where it really fits into your business. And once you've been able to identify those high value uh, uses and applications, then go for it. You know, do the things that are necessary to empower and enable your employees to make use of the technology in order to help uh, accelerate your business and to meet your business goals. So uh, I don't think everybody has to go around with their hair on fire on this particular subject. I think it's just like any other new technology. Just keep, keep your eyes open, figure out uh, what kinds of things it might do for your business, and mostly uh, let a thousand flowers bloom, as the expression goes, and see which of them grow particularly well and make sure you focus on those. <music>